Well, hi folks and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. In this episode, we're going to go over why the rays of the sun are parallel when they reach the Earth, and then go over the results of both Eratosthenes and the repeat of Eratosthenes that Blue Marble Science and I did during the spring equinox this year. We know from our observations that the sun and the moon look to be about the same size, and they both appear to be very close. Actually, even though the moon and the sun do appear to be about the same angular size in the sky, to make the assumption that they are close is indeed an assumption. So let's cue up the music and get started on Fifty Shades of Phuket, Eratosthenes, Part 2. Let's just, I mean, if we look at what, what makes more sense to you to say that the sun is making parallel lines of light or these kinds of lines of light. Now let's see if we can make a little bit of sense out of this. Say we have the sun here in the center in yellow and then we have the Earth out in blue, and the black is the orbit of the Earth. Now, if you look at the entire orbit of the Earth, that's 360 degrees. Now, if you look at the angle of the sunlight that comes out from the sun to one side of the Earth, and then comes out from the sun to the other side of the Earth, you see that there is a very tiny angle between the two, and this is massively exaggerated. If you look at this ray of light and that ray of light, what's the difference in angle? It may only be about one half of a minute of angle. That's very, very small, okay? Uh, a matter of arc seconds. And what's happening here is that those sun rays are actually coming in more or less in parallel. In which case, on a flat Earth as we can see here, we would then get different angles of the sun's rays creating no shadow here on this vertical one. If, the, if we're standing here and the sun is directly above us, then there will be no shadow. But if the sun remains here, and we are at some distance away from this place, then we, we do get a sun ray coming to us on a flat Earth like this. This makes much more sense. All right, so I think that you're starting to see what the problem is here. Now, the fact that the sun's rays are arriving at the Earth in parallel is an observable fact, okay? The reason that that happens is that our orbit from the sun is 94 million miles, and by the time you divide all that up into 360 degrees and start dividing it and dividing it and dividing it into minutes and seconds, you're going to see that the rays of the sun that arrive at one end of the planet versus the rays that arrive at the other end of the planet are coming in at almost the same angle, and they are essentially parallel. Now, what Nick is making a problem with here is he is making an assumption that the sun is local. Let's go ahead and illustrate that with my observation at the spring equinox. Now, I was up at the 45th parallel, and the angle of the shadow that I got was 45 degrees. Now, we know that this is a right angle because the sun up here was directly above the equator. So we know that this distance is the same as that distance because that's 45 degrees and then this would be 45 degrees up here as well. That would give us a height for the sun. Now here's the problem that we run into and that is that my friend Harry or uh, Blue Marble Science, he did an observation down here. Well, to make a long story short, here are the actual numbers. Now, Harry was down at 35.51 
north than I was at 44.165 north. All right. If you read the actual numbers of the shadow lengths, the sun angles, the complementary angles, etc., you can actually calculate what the circumference of the Earth will be. Now you see, I up in Michigan got 24.179. Harry down in Tennessee with a longer stick got 24.874. That was less than a, a one-tenth of a percent error for his part and less than three percent for me and i used a seven inch builder square now the last column is the important one apparent sun altitude and that's where we do the triangles to find the elevation of the sun notice we got three different numbers there and they varied by over 400 miles on a local sun that would be 3400 miles away you can't have a sun in more than one place, especially one that's supposedly 32 miles in diameter. And fits with reality than the idea that we have uh, parallel lines. This doesn't make sense. In fact, this is, a, this is one of those examples of the globe Earth proponent claiming that the flat earther can't see in 3D. Well, basically what you did was you just confirmed that, Nick, all right? You've made a couple of assumptions here. First of all, we can observe that light from the sun arrives on the Earth in parallel rays. Because you are making the assumption, actually the narrative, that the sun must be local, that doesn't make sense for you. So what you're doing is you're actually changing reality to try and make a local sun fit. A local sun would not have parallel rays. If it's only 3,400 miles above the ground, you're going to see significant differences in the angle of the sun on, on 500 miles either way from directly underneath it. Now, that would fit if you could do that with two spots, but you can only do it with one spot. And the reason that you can only do it with one spot is that the Earth is not flat. It's spherical. The sun is distant. The rays arrive in parallel. You're running into the same problem that you ran into with a sextant. A sextant will not work on a flat Earth any more than this will. This, this is what we are given. We are given these parallel lines of light and a curved surface. But really, we, we could we could Oops, we can consider it this way, or we can consider it this way. You see, it is all open to interpretation. Well, no, Nick, it absolutely is not. Because, first, you're not drawing the rays of light properly, um, because they're not coming from the edges of the sun. They're coming basically from the center mass of the sun, but because we are so far away, they're arriving at Earth in parallel. You are insistent on trying to bring the sun in close so that those rays have to diverge very quickly. That's not what's occurring, all right? We're only a very tiny part of that 360 degree arc around the sun on our orbit. Now, this does not work on a flat Earth, as I have demonstrated with measurements all right we checked here and we checked in tennessee we got different heights to the sun in both places all right that was basically looking at it as a flat surface with a local sun at a measurable distance which we could triangulate okay now that's not what's occurring the sun's rays are arriving at earth in parallel and the only way that we're getting proper measurements based on our latitude is the fact that the surface is curved, you know? It's curved. So instead of coming in like this, they're coming in like this at a slightly different angle. And as we've seen, we've got Eratosthenes touted as the founder or the person who calculated, calculated not, not measured, calculated the circumference. Now, Nick, this is the other problem that you have. You seem to look at using a yardstick 
to measure the distance between Los Angeles and Sydney is the only appropriate way to measure that distance. We can measure it many other ways. You've already demonstrated that you believe in triangulation in your videos. You understand trigonometry. So we can calculate these distances just as accurately as if we took a yardstick out and did them. So there's no difference between a calculated distance and one that you run a tape on. You just need to know how to do it. And you're demonstrating here that you don't. Did he perhaps calculate the circumference of the circle that the sun makes above a flat earth? Uh, no. It is simply an observation of a light in the sky that is doing circles above a flat earth, a motionless earth, that could be infinite. Do you remember what I said in an earlier video about the flat earth having to have a narrative and stick with that narrative no matter what other facts appear? You're demonstrating that again, Nick. And this is why I don't propose any model. Don't propose any alternative because we cannot know. You know, Nick, the reason that you can't give us a model is that you don't have one, all right? There is no model so far that you've been able to come up with that even comes close to explaining what we see in the natural world. But you know something? Even though you say the reason you don't have a model is because you can't know what the natural world is and create a model from it, I'm willing to bet that you're gonna have an opinion on what the Earth is not. But what we can know is that the historical accounts we are given of the so-called discoveries are not discoveries. The only thing that's been discovered is a way to interpret the measurements that can be made or the observations that can be made. That goes for all of these people, Galileo, Newton, Einstein, Eratosthenes, Nicholas Copernicus, and whoever else you want to mention. All right, so basically your response to this overwhelming evidence that the Earth is a sphere is to sit down and say, eh, that's just their opinion. Well, it was their opinion that one plus one equals two. It's their opinion that this is closer to six inches than it is to three feet. And quite frankly, I can actually measure the darn thing, okay? That's the difference between science and your narrative in the Flat Earth movement. Because they've made observations of intangible objects in the sky, created two-dimensional models to represent three or four dimensions and ignoring or translating perspective. You knew he was gonna say it, didn't you? He wasn't gonna use it right, but you knew he was gonna say it. Which governs all observations that we make into an imaginary curve. So this picture that you see here is a much more realistic illustration of reality than this. You know, here's the funny thing. Nick's right. That's the way sunlight actually works. However, because the sun is so distant, the second illustration was actually reality. But does that give us any idea of the distance or the size of the sun? Uh, no, but that would be an answer to a question that wasn't asked, now wouldn't it be? If we took this image and we, 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 we changed this, power, this line up here to a, a seven degrees angle to meet this 
line. Remember, this line would represent the actual center of the sun, and this line could then be angled at seven degrees to eventually meet the sun. We could then uh, create a new model with a local sun over a flat earth based on that. Yep, you sure could. And it'd be wrong because that would give you 4,065 miles to the sun, which is the third distance to the 3,400 versus the 3,000 miles that Harry and I got. So you can't have a sun in more than one place at the same time. I mean, you get that, right? 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 And nothing would change. Nothing would change about the angles or the distances between those two points or the length of the shadow. So anyone who proposes that repeating these experiments and observations and measurements is somehow some kind of proof that we live on a globe is not being scientific and they are not offering up any proof. All they are doing is coming to a conclusion based on a presupposition that has no way of being confirmed as proving that we live on a spinning globe going around the sun in a heliocentric system. Uh, no. No, I don't think so. We've got lots of evidence. All they can ever do is uh, prove the model. But the model is just one of many possible interpretations of our reality. Well, possibly, but then again, it just happens to be the right one, the one that's supported by the evidence. There's no need for the Earth to be moving. The only reason we are told that it's moving and we have a big bang that created everything to be spinning and come together with gravity, etc., is just ideas and theories to try to gel together this heliocentric model. There has never, ever been any proof that we live on a globe. And when we take measurements of our immediate surroundings and we look at real world physics, we come to the realization that it's impossible that we are on a globe. Well, no, because Nick, there it is. It's a globe. We checked. So do your own research, make your own measurements, make your own observations, put everything together if you can and see what you can come up with. And then you'll realize that the globe is a fabrication that has no basis in reality. Well, you see, Nick, here's the problem that you run into. It's great to be able to do your own observations and come to your own conclusions. However, you have to actually understand and use evidence. You have to acknowledge the fact that the horizon is below eye level. You can easily test for that. Simply because it doesn't fit your narrative doesn't mean that it's wrong. Simply because it's something that you don't particularly understand doesn't mean it's wrong. Ask somebody who does understand it. Have them explain it to you. Hell, ask me. I'll be happy to explain things to you, like perspective. So, in any event, let's go ahead and uh, end, end this on out. I think that we've covered it as much as it needs to be covered. Uh, guys, do me a favor. Hit that little like button down there so you can subscribe to my channel. I'm getting close to 10,000. I could really use your help. I'd like to count you with them. So this is Bob the Science Guy, signing out from Northern Michigan. We'll talk again soon. This rabbit hole's too deep for me. Feel my brain getting real sore.